Well, thanks uh, everybody for coming in in the morning. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity to share our uh, work uh, on intestinal lengthening over the past couple of decades. I do have some disclosures. Uh, I'm the co-founder of uh, Eclipse Regenesis, which is the company that's making this uh, device uh, for the patients with short gut. I'm also the consultants for a couple of the companies that are not relevant for the purpose of this presentation. Here's a scenario that's not uncommon uh, on the pediatric surgery service. And uh, this is a premature baby who uh, developed abdominal distension after getting feeds and that uh, diagnosed with necrotizing enterocolitis. And uh, at uh, uh, exploration, uh, lots of the intestines found to be affected by this process. And this baby ends up losing the majority of the intestine and not having enough to absorb nutrients. And this is one of the pathways uh, for patients uh, to have short bowel syndrome, but it's really a group of diseases that can all lead to this final common pathway of not having enough intestine for absorption. Uh, generally speaking, at least half of the small intestine is lost and that uh, they are then supported by parental nutrition. The parental nutrition has really changed the outlook of these kids, uh, which uh, of course uh, used to be fatal, uh, but now um, they can survive for a long time, at least in the um, industrialized countries. There are still other countries where the mortality for these patients are still very high because of the um, problems related to parental nutrition delivery. Uh, but even in this country, uh, there are many associated complications with parental nutrition long-term, uh, often times related to sepsis uh, because of the central venous catheter and Liver, dam <clears throat> liver damage that occurs as a result of um, long-term parental nutrition use. Um, but all those things are improving and many of these kids uh, really have a pretty uh, good outlook uh, these days, even with extreme shortcut, which is defined as having less than 20 centimeters of small intestine. However, it's still very expensive. Uh, the average cost for maintain being maintained on parental nutrition for a year is $200,000 and that um, uh, the uh, number of patients uh, who are needing this support in the United States is around 40,000. And that multiplies out to be $8 billion a year. So a uh, very expensive um, way to address this problem. Oftentimes, so the remaining intestine in these patients dilate. This is the body's uh, attempt to try to adapt. So it's trying to grow, but it doesn't grow uh, too much in the longitudinal fashion, but it tends to grow a lot more radially. So it becomes a very dilated piece of intestine as illustrated here on one of the patients. Uh, however, this adaptation is maladaptive because uh, with a very dilated piece of intestine, it doesn't squeeze so well. So there's poor motility in these segments. And as a result, bacterial overgrowth and then the, all the various septic complications related to that can happen. Well, surgeons have uh, thought about this problem and tried to address this by doing what's called intestinal lengthening procedures. And illustrated here are the Bianchi procedure as well as the so-called STEP procedure. The Bianchi procedure is illustrated on the top there. And this is a procedure that's described uh, quite a while ago uh, in the 80s. And, and uh, in this procedure, a piece of intestine is divided longitudinally down the axis taking advantage of the dual blood supply from the mesentery to either side of the intestine so that you end up with a narrower channel but are longer in length and then they're connected together. A technically simpler operation is the so-called serial transverse enteroplasty or a step procedure, whereby instead of dividing the intestine down the axis, it's divided transverse to the axis, long axis, as illustrated on the bottom um, picture there. This way you also end up with narrower channels of zigzagging <clears throat> intestine that's longer. These procedures are associated with significant complications and it's unclear uh, which patients may benefit from this procedure, uh, but most of the benefit is in the tapering aspect of what's accomplished so that you don't have very dilated intestine. And if you think about what happened after these procedures, the amount of surface area that you have is the same. It's just that it's divided into narrower channels. 
Uh, in fact, you probably lose a little bit of intestine because with every division, you end up squishing some of the tissue together. So you don't end up with net growth of um, intestinal cell mass. Now, surgeons, we have lots of examples where we can do things to the tissue to make it grow. And here's one example, uh, distraction osteogenesis. This is uh, the so-called Elizarov device. And what happens uh, here is that uh, if you um, break the bone in the mid portion, and then you put forces on either end of it, and you slowly crank these uh, devices so that they separate the bone, uh, the little gap in between is filled in with real cells that proliferate and then turn into bone later on. And this is a procedure that's used really quite routinely these days, uh, not so much um, for the leg, but oftentimes for other places like uh, kids who are born with micronathia. And this is a routine way to distract their mandible so that they end up with a bigger uh, mandible. So well-established techniques, and there are many other examples, plastic surgeons use tissue expanders to grow more skin. So by applying the force in a careful control manner, we're able to grow more tissue. So this idea then came to me that we ought to be able to do the same for the small intestine. There's no reason why the small intestine should not respond to force and that uh, we ought to be able to bring this similar idea to the best side. So um, about um, uh, almost 20 years ago, uh, a um, pediatric surgeon, uh, Dr. Park picture here, came from uh, Korea and he uh, was tasked with this project uh, and what's done here on the uh, left-hand side is the schematics. A segment of intestine is taken out of continuity and it's brought up to the abdominal wall. And then one end of it is closed and the other end of it is inserted with a screw and nut device so that you can gradually turn the screw to push on the end, closed end of the intestine. And by slowly turning that screw uh, millimeter at a time, in about three weeks, you end up with that result that's shown on the right. You turn a little piece of intestine into a much longer piece of intestine, almost tripling the length of the intestine. And it's not like you're just stretching things out, unlike a toy balloon where when you blow it up, it becomes, <clears throat> it becomes longer, but the material gets stretched out and becomes thinner. There's actually induced growth of the cells as a result of the applied force. And that's illustrated here histologically. To cut a cross section through the intestine, uh, this is the comparison of a piece of normal jejunum in a rat to that piece of intestine after the lengthening that I just showed you. There is growth of all the layers of the intestine. The crypts get longer, the villi get taller, the muscle gets thicker. So there's real growth of the cells. And if you look at this process earlier on, what happens is that when you stretch things, you end up creating spaces and the body responds to that by uh, proliferation. And for example, the crypt where the uh, intestinal epithelium is generated, on the left-hand side, you can see that, uh, uh, what that looks like in a normal jejunum. This is now in a pig, but uh, similar things have been observed in other animals as well. But during the lengthening process, these crypts start to get wider and they undergo fission. Uh, so that you end up with more crypts at the end of this process. So uh, the idea of uh, applying the mechanical force to end up with more tissue is something that uh, uh, we thought could be useful. And um, to be able to apply that in a clinical setting, We did this uh, with a external way of distracting the intestine, external distraction enterogenesis. So illustrated on the left-hand side is a picture of an infant who has a stoma that you can see. And this baby has lost just about all of the intestine except for uh, a little bit of ileum uh, that's pictured there, a centimeter of that ileum and just a little stump. And that uh, uh, if we were to connect to that, uh, it would be pretty short um, and that uh, um, it would be a little risky to sew things to the very end of the ileum. 
So instead of doing that, we decided to apply this principle of distraction anthrogenesis, whereby a catheter is threaded into this remaining one centimeter piece of ilium, and diagram actually shown in the middle there. And then uh, we marked it with clips so that we can see the progress of it. And then uh, uh, the catheter is brought out through the other side of the bundle wall. And then we gradually stretch that piece of the intestine. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see what this looks like. It's just a Foley catheter put into this little piece of tiny ileum, blown up with a balloon, marked with these clips. Then over time, uh, this report uh, is uh, uh, made by Taylor here, um, Taylor and Sinar Bona residents, um, shown here. So if you look at these various uh, uh, um, X-ray radiographs, uh, on the top left is what happens right after we put this in. Um, and the uh, star, the green star marks a just a reference clip uh, so that you can compare sizes uh, to it. And then between the red arrow and the yellow arrow uh, is that little piece of ileum. And then uh, uh, we gradually stretch that over time. You can see that day zero, we waited four days, just allowing things to heal a little bit. And then we start pulling on this catheter a little at a time. And if you measure the distance between the yellow and the red arrow over the course of time, you'll see that it gets larger and larger and that's uh, quantified on this graph here. And you can see that over about three weeks or so, we are able to, again, uh, increase the length to uh, about uh, more than doubling of the initial length. So this concept of distraction anthrogenesis works uh, in the human. And that uh, the problem, of course, is that once you pull this catheter and you reach the other end of the abdominal wall, that's the end of the process. Plus, as you all know, uh, when you have catheters in patients, they tend to fall out. So uh, not a durable solution. So we thought that we really ought to develop ways uh, to try to do this in an internal fashion, a device that can be put on the inside so that you don't have to have these external um, uh, things to manipulate. So for this work, um, uh, uh, Sean Shekardemia, who's a pediatric surgeon now at UCLA, he was a resident at the time. Uh, we worked on this uh, uh, approach whereby we separated a piece of intestine from continuity as illustrated on the picture on the left-hand side there. And then we closed off both ends of the intestine. This is so that a piece of spring uh, made from nitinol can push against the two ends as it naturally wants to expand. And Greg Carmen also pictured there is the mechanical engineer who's a sort of a nitinol expert helped us with this project. And we were able to show that uh, uh, this works, that if you put this compressed piece of spring inside an uh, isolated segment of the intestine, it too uh, will grow as the spring will exert the force according to Hooke's law. As it expands, it pushes uh, the, on the two ends and you end up uh, having tripling of the length of intestine as well in a matter of three weeks or so. And of course, everybody wants to know, well, um, does it work, right? You end up with a piece of intestine that's longer, but does it work? So uh, Rebecca Stark, another pediatric surgeon now, um, worked on this project. So diagrammatically illustrated there, we separated a piece of intestine like I showed you, expanded it, and then now she puts it back into continuity so that it can uh, be used uh, for absorption and so forth. And we have subsequently uh, done studies like motility. You can see uh, this floral study um, in a rat, uh, there's the contrast in the stomach there, and then it goes through. And the two white arrows that you see uh, are clips that are between the segments of the intestines as we store back into continuity. And the black arrow points to that segment. We know that that's our segment because of the marking of the clips. And you can see that it peristalsis and squeezes. And then we've also done an absorption study to make sure that uh, per uh, centimeter of this intestine that we put back in, that it can absorb water, glucose, and that sort of thing normally. In fact, you can see that it's actually a little bit super normal. And, be, uh, and that's because of what I showed you before, 
this lengthening of the villi. So the absorption is actually increased per centimeter of intestine. So with all of that done, uh, it's a bit of a hassle to have to cut out a piece of intestine, stretch it, and then put it back in. Lots of surgeries and it's really unnecessary to do that if we can come up with a way to do this in continuity while the intestine is still inside. And the trick is that you have to find a way to secure the spring so that it is confined in a spot that doesn't just move around. And um, uh, to do this, uh, we tried different ways. Uh, it turns out that if you just suture the spring to the intestinal wall, then the force that it exerts is concentrated at the areas of the sutures. And then that force just pulls the suture out like a seton does. Uh, so it just cuts through the tissue rather than exerting the force that expands the segment. So what we came up with is a plication method that's illustrated here. And in this method, um, uh, you can see that the spring is placed inside a segment intestine. And then serosal sutures are used to placate either end of the intestine in a way that narrows the lumen temporarily because these are absorbable sutures. And that uh, uh, with that, it's able to confine the spring in place but because of the design of the spring, it's hollow, luminal contents can still pass through. And we did this in uh, pigs and the uh, photograph in the middle is uh, showing you how that looks like with the spring in a little capsule in the middle there and then placating sutures on either side. And with time, uh, in about three weeks time, again, the intestinal segment uh, lengthens and that uh, this uh, seems to work well. So for each spring, uh, at the compressed state, it goes down to maybe uh, one and a half centimeters or so. And when it fully expands, it goes up to four or five. You can't make it too long uh, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, there's curvature to the intestine so that if you make it too long, uh, then at some point, it doesn't make that natural turn that intestine does. And of course, the size of the abdominal cavity also limits how long you can make the spring. You can't make it longer than the width of the abdomen. So for each spring that's placed, you can have a fixed amount of length, a few centimeters more of length, which in the overall scheme of things is helpful, but it's not gonna get somebody off of parental nutrition. So to be able to do this, you really need to be able to scale this up. That's illustrated here. So uh, we thought, okay, we'll just place multiple springs and that uh, by placing multiple springs, then each segment will contribute to a few centimeters. And then if you add them all up, then you'll have a much more significant increase in small bowel length. And that was shown here. You can see the uh, photograph of how that's done in the animals. Uh, we put three springs in this particular animal. And they all started uh, to expand and got longer. So the idea of scaling that up uh, is feasible. And then also once a segment has extended its length, uh, is it possible then now to re-expand it? to make it even longer a second time around. And that's some work that um, Andrew Scott had carried out. And uh, he created a rule and wire model where in the um, blind rule in, he was able to put the springs in, expanded it, and then uh, went back into that rule in, put in another spring. And he was able to show that you're able to repeatedly lengthen a segment of the intestine. So this gives us a really a uh, clinically feasible way to be able to go back in and continue to lengthen the intestine until you have enough intestine for absorption. So a pathway to hopefully get some of these kids um, with short bowel off of parental nutrition. And then uh, so far, all of this work um, have been done in otherwise normal intestine. So um, uh, we want to make sure that uh, uh, in the setting of shore bowel, this also works. So we created a shore bowel model in pigs. We resected 80% of their small intestine, allowed it for adaptation to take place so that the intestine becomes a little bigger, a little thicker. And then we also, again, place springs at that point. And what's uh, uh, illustrated on the graph here is that uh, the, um, the control segment at the third time point um, after we have placed the spring, uh, uh, the control segment remains short, and then the one that with the spring 
again, um, more than doubles uh, that length. So uh, with all of this work uh, done, we thought we had pretty good data and we filed a patent and was able to get granted with a uh, US patent uh, on this device that is able to expand the length of hollow organs, in this case, the intestine, but you can in theory use this for other tissue like um, esophagus, for example. But anyways, uh, the whole idea was to try to tackle the shore bowel uh, patients. So with this uh, patent issue, uh, to really make this uh, into the clinical setting, uh, you need to be able to develop a product that is all FDA approved. And that's a long road uh, to do uh, of, of university uh, setting. So you really need to get somebody to go through all the various uh, hard uh, nitty gritties of uh, making that happen. And this is uh, the start of that journey uh, that I alluded to in the beginning, uh, crossing the valley of death. So at that time, a couple of guys uh, came to me and he, they were interested in developing this product and they uh, um, said, okay, uh, we'll try to raise money uh, to make this happen. And they got a lease uh, um, uh, for this patent that we have. And they went around and after a couple of years, uh, no success in fundraising. And this is part of the so-called uh, the valley of death. So uh, this is a uh, picture taken from nature uh, uh, where they talked about this problem. The whole idea where you have good basic science, good data, and then to be able to bring that to the patient's bedside, there are many, many uh, obstacles and lots of things die in that process uh, in the valley of death. And it turns out that uh, even though I think it's important uh, to treat patients with short bowel syndrome, but the reality is that the market is small. So if you try to raise money from people who are interested in investing, uh, they want to know how much return they can get. And for a small market uh, product, uh, many are not interested. Also, uh, for pediatric devices, there are other uh, concerns that uh, uh, this is probably the worst market to try to tackle and to raise funds uh, for. So that didn't work. And then the company basically uh, went belly up. And then um, uh, at that time, I also moved from UCLA to Stanford. And with lots of the sort of the know-how of the Silicon Valley and also the help of uh, Tom Crummel at the time, he was supposed to get this uh, work restarted uh, I'll call company 2.0. And this occurred on the day of the solar eclipse in 2017. Some of you may remember uh, the solar eclipse swept across the United States on that day. And then that just happened to be the day that we uh, formed the company. Um, so we decided to call it eclipse uh, for that reason. And that uh, the first order of course is try to uh, raise funds because you uh, need to do lots of things uh, to make this into a clinical reality. A lot of that is fundraising. So we started with uh, C grants uh, and Stanford is good with that. There are lots of C grant mechanisms and we got a culture grant uh, that helped uh, start that process. Uh, we also got money from a bunch of other sources, both uh, um, venture capital as well as from uh, national sources like the NIH and NSF to run uh, these small business uh, innovation grants. Um, and uh, a lot of this is really only possible uh, because of the various uh, uh, connections that exist in our, um, I think, really unique environment at Stanford. So with all of that um, uh, done, uh, we uh, got uh, a clinical device uh, into production uh, you would think nitinol, you know, pretty standard medical material, no big deal, making a spring. But that process took a long time um, to approve. There are a bunch of testing that are done, and you think with, again, standard material, there should be no problem, but uh, there were uh, lots of uh, uh, obstacles came up, and we have uh, hired people who gave us uh, these kinds of help. Uh, the device was initially 
manufactured by Meraki, and then um, Alphamed is a uh, sort of a regulatory agency that helped us. But we came with the device, uh, a spring, and then it's compressed uh, together with uh, uh, sutures that are holding it in place. And it's uh, on one end of a delivery stick so that you can push it into the desired position and then release uh, the spring. And then uh, we are able to also get what's called the humanitarian use device uh, designation, HUD, which is uh, devices or treatments that you give uh, to patients uh, where the incidence is less than 8,000 uh, in the United States per year. And this is helpful because then uh, this uh, will eventually be more um, uh, uh, appetizing for some of the investors. And Cooley is a law firm company and, and uh, uh, that help us with lots of the uh, legal aspect of this. All this of course takes a lot of money, but we were finally able to go to the FDA uh, for our pre-submission to get a investigational device uh, exemption uh, uh, to be able to try this in human. And uh, Tom Cromo, picture here, uh, Andre Bissett, the CEO of the company, uh, Eric Banyan, uh, the uh, advisor from our regulatory consultant, and Mark Pewter, another pediatric surgeon. We are all there uh, to talk to the FDA about uh, a tr clinical trial uh, to try this out in human. And that was on February 28th, 2020. That date doesn't uh, ring a bell. Well, a few days later, shutdown from COVID happened. Worse than that, the FDA told us, well, it's nice that you showed us all this data, but we'd like to see long-term animal data. We want you to keep pigs for six months and see what happens to the intestine. So we had to come up with the resources and the ability to do this all during COVID um, uh, for a long-term study, which was able to be done. So we had to do it, uh, a long-term um, GLP, uh, collaboratory practice uh, study. And we demonstrated that there was no uh, perforation or obstruction that happened and that uh, there was significant lengthening. And what's shown in the histology here are the um, histology of the intestine taken at different time points. And we are out to 180 days. Uh, on panel D there uh, is really indistinguishable from the normal control uh, intestine. And then these springs that were held in place by those plicating sutures that were absorbable, they all pass naturally out of the rest of the GI tract in these pigs so that there is no need for retrieval. So uh, with that, the FDA finally said yes. In June of 22, they granted us the investigational uh, device exemption and that uh, we were able to start um, recruiting patients. And uh, the caveat to that is that they say you can't do this in kids first. So after all of that, they say you have to do them in adults first. So that was very frustrating. Um, kids, of course, I think would benefit much more from this. Um, but of course, there are adult shortcut patients, but they're not concentrated in centers. They're dispersed in different places. It's hard to get those patients. But that's what the FDA wanted. So uh, in partnership with Joy Forrester, David Spain here, uh, who have uh, some of these uh, terrible um, bowel patients with fistulae and short gut from multiple uh, prior operations uh, became the uh, um, suitable subject. Um, and that uh, we were able to get an IRB from Stanford to conduct uh, a trial and that um, the uh, hospital also needed to have a clinical trial agreement uh, made so that uh, they know uh, who is paying for what and that sort of thing. And then uh, finally, on March 8th, 2023, we were able to do the first in human study. So on the uh, picture on the left-hand side, uh, I'm holding the device. Um, and then uh, Joe is there. And uh, this is a patient, a uh, 30-some-year-old patient uh, who has had multiple operations with multiple intracutaneous fistulae and uh, has about 100 centimeters of a small intestine, has been on TPN. And that uh, 
uh, Joe's brought him in and that um, the patient consented to uh, be our first test subject. And then on the right-hand side is sort of the, the finished product. Uh, the two clips that uh, you see uh, are marking the two ends of the segment that we have inserted the spring. It's a little bit hard to see, but they're placating sutures on either side of this that's holding it in place. And that um, happens after that was uh, nerve wracking to see what happens in the first human uh, subject, but uh, uh, he pretty much uh, uh, behaved like what we have seen in the pigs. So on the very first radiograph show on the left-hand side, you can see this little compressed spring that's sitting in a segment of the small intestine. And then the, with the serial radiographs, you can see that the spring is starting to expand, starting to get larger. And then uh, once it's um, uh, finished with its expansion and then the absorbable sutures uh, uh, went away, it started to traverse through the rest of the GI tract. And then uh, here it is in the colon. Um, and then the, uh, the next radiograph, which I don't have here, shows that the spring is gone. The patient did not realize that he passed the spring uh, and that the, the uh, spring has come out, come out of his anus in a natural way. So a great success. Um, and that was uh, um, about six months ago. Since then, we've had difficulty in getting more patients. These are just not patients that are, are uh, around a lot, but uh, uh, I believe uh, there's one potential patient in November, maybe two. Uh, so we're hoping to um, uh, do more of these. So after this journey, and I sort of uh, was reflecting on this process uh, of all the various difficulties and whatnot, uh, the first thing I did was sort of, kind of added up all the various expenses related to this device. So the device is pretty simple, right? It's a little spring made of nitinol. Well, all the things I have described and all of the things that I uh, that we had to do to um, make this happen in this first patient. Some of you may know uh, this uh, TV show uh, in the 70s, uh, Lee Majors uh, plays uh, Steve Austin, who uh, uh, was injured and they made him sort of a superhuman by uh, giving him a uh, vision that uh, is uh, beyond the, uh, well beyond human capability, hearing and so forth. And they call it the $6 million man because that's how much it took to sort of a rebuild Steve Austin. Well, for this particular patient that we just described, um, uh, and then at the end of that uh, trial that we did, we spent about $6 million uh, on uh, this process so far. So anyways, um, he is the $6 million man. I have not told this patient that, but um, anyways, hopefully more to come. All right, in summary, I hope I've shown you that the intestine can grow in response to applied mechanical force and that an external tube can be used to produce the lengthening in human. Uh, the trouble is that you can't do this uh, in a repeated fashion and it's really cumbersome to do. But uh, of note, you should realize that to do that, it's within the so-called scope of practice, right? Putting tubes in the intestine is something that we do all the time. So uh, after I told the family why I plan to do, why I hope to be able to see, they consent to that process, I could do it. But now that I have a new device and want to do this better, because it's a new device, I have to go through all those regulatory type things I described to you. But nevertheless, I hope I've shown you that the deployment of springs in the lumen intestine can also lead to intestinal lengthening, and that it's able to pass through the GI tract uh, once the plaiting sutures could be absorbed. Uh, we've uh, shown safety as well as uh, effectiveness in the first human subject. That subject, by the way, is off of TPN now, not necessarily due to my little device, but uh, lots of other things. But at least uh, that uh, uh, is a good outcome. And then further studies, of course, are needed uh, to show uh, clinical benefits. And hopefully we'll be able to do this study in the kids who really need this uh, procedure done uh, in the near future. Thank you. Happy to take any questions.